And now we are live on the Gamification Hi. Revolution. Hi, it's episode number nine. I'm Gabe Zickerman. We're here with Ty Kelly, which is the way you pronounce his name, the first mm -hmm. uh, few letters of the word tiger. Hi, Ty, mm -hmm. how are you? Hi, Gabe, good to meet you. Nice to see you, dude. I'm, and uh, well. Ty has recently uh, moved to Seattle from um, London. From where were you living before? I, I was in London. I'm, I'm originally Irish from Dublin, but I emigrated to London about ooh, 12 years ago, uh, maybe 11 years ago. And six weeks ago, I up sticks again and came to America. And so tell everybody what it is that you do now. Um, in sure. So um, prior to coming over here, I was largely a games consultant working for a variety of companies all across the spectrum, including some gamification uh, uh, roles. Um, but I've recently sort of put all that to one side and come to work for a company called Jawfish Games, um, who focus on sort of real-time synchronous multiplayer games, um, particularly on, say, iPhone or iPad, of which there aren't that many, and uh, often uh, they don't necessarily have sort of good technology behind them. So we have a really good back end that, that services those kinds of games, and we have a, a whole slew of game designs that we're um, getting ready to kind of plug into it. And, um, and hopefully make a really big thing out of tournament-based gaming um, within that space. I've been brought on as the creative director, so like I was saying to you earlier, I get to be the guy who goes, I've got this crazy idea for a game kind of thing. And, um, and, uh, and yeah. And you guys just won a big award, no? We did. We won the Consumer 2.0 Award at uh, the Launch Festival in San Francisco last week. Um, which was a very huge deal for us, obviously just personally, it's a great validation for, for all that we're doing. And uh, it's stoked quite a lot of interest in sort of the community as to what exactly is it that we do and why is it possibly the next big thing. Cool. Well, I, I actually want to dig, we're going to dig a little bit into multiplayer designs and uh, some of the lessons that people can learn, I think. I'm sorry, I, I lost you there for a second. Uh, in a minute. Now, most people who follow the gamification discussion, and of course, for those of you who watch Gamification Revolution or, or follow, follow me or... Um, uh, follow the gamification discussion at gamification.co. Uh, you also, of course, will know that uh, Gamification Summit is coming up in April from the 16th to sure. the 18th in San Francisco. You can sure. find out more about it um, at gsummit.com. But Ty, mm -hmm. so most people, who rec most people who've been following the discussion about gamification, uh, you know, probably know uh, and have seen your writing on TechCrunch about sure. uh, game design, where you have a sort of regular column. And so yeah. I want to back up to an interesting sort of article that you wrote some uh, not that long ago in uh, November of last year um, about where you sort of laid out your view of what works in gamification. You described it as validation, completion, mm -hmm. and prizes mm -hmm. as being the three yeah. big things. Can, can you tell us about this validation, completion, and prizes concept that you... Sure, sure. About? So my, my kind of, in fact, a lot of my thinking on gamification comes from a slightly older article that I had written on my own site about a year previously, um, where I, I talked about, I, I had a, a thing about, and I have a, do think, have a thing a lot about what I call metagames, like that the idea that at sort of games at a kind of a higher level, um, if you like, can sort of work if they don't necessarily work at a lower level, I often find to be quite Unfortunately and disappointingly, um, uh, it doesn't sort of tend to kind of bear through. So I had said, I think gamification may fall into the same trap that, say, virtual worlds fall into, or that, um, uh, like, alter, uh, what do they call ARGs sort of fell into, which is that they're very reliant on player spirit, for the want of a better word, to, to work. And what I said was, I thought it was very important for gamificators, if that's a word, um, to, to keep it real. And by, by keeping it real, what I really meant is stay very focused on um, the understanding, A, the objectives that they want to achieve. So I said in the same article, I said you need to focus on trying to make one number go up, whether it's engagement on your site, whether it's transactions, whether it's user eyeballs, whatever. Like you really have to be narrowly focused on, on okay, this is the thing, this is the outcome that we're going to try and achieve. And I said that the sorts of motivators that actually tend to motivate users in a gaming context um, actually tend to be quite naked. So the um, prizes is a very good case in point. Air miles or AVOS points as they're called now, um, they are largely motivated for the vast majority of people who, who collect them purely by um, the fact that you can get sort of cheap flights from them or you can get better upgrades on flights or those kinds of things. Like it's very transactional. 
And while it's kind of fun and it's kind of nice to have a number like that, just like a series of points that go up and to check in every once in a while and, and kind of add them in and stuff. If you didn't have that um, that kind of prize component to them, um, you really wouldn't get that much. You wouldn't get that much interest. You would always find a few users to do because there's always someone somewhere who just does like to collect points. And you know, fair enough. But the for a lot of people, they, they're much more kind of empirical. If you want a better word about that. Um, so, so that was kind of the main thing. So, the, the, was, so I think it's a really interesting kind of point. So one of the complexities, like uh, I'm sorry, I, I, I can't hear you. Air mile side tag. Um, okay. So one of the complexities. I, so it's an interesting point. One of the complexities about the air mile side is this is, and this is one of the difficulties for gamification folks. That I want to explore from your perspective a little bit. Sure. So in the typical kind of in the typical kind of airline loyalty program environment, um, like let's take a United Mileage Plus just because I happen to know the numbers more or less. Uh, okay, so they have about a hundred million members, and of the hundred million or so members of their loyalty program, they have about a uh, hundred to one hundred fifty thousand people who I think would fall into your sort of category. You talk about the people who derive pleasure just from the kind of accumulation of points and really leaned in on sure. kind of playing this game in a kind of like hardcore way. Mm -hmm. Those people account for about 40% of the revenues of the airline. So the, the, okay. com the thing is, how do you balance off as a designer, just even thinking about from the perspective of a game designer, right? How do you balance off the disproportionate impact of those hardcore people who want to do something that, let's say, the vast majority of people kind of think is like, eh, how do you balance that off, those two groups off against each other? Well, the, in fact, that's a, really, that's a really, really hard challenge because on the one hand, you have the players um, who, for whom the game is very vertical like that. It is just a real sort of deep, deep, deep activity that they're involved in. And they're, for the long better word, the effects of how they play can splash out very easily onto, onto your more casual player, for the long better word. You're more kind of, I'm just sort of having fun with this I'm kind of player. Their activity can very much, the hardcore player, for the long better word, can very much disincentivize the casual player who can sort of feel that he has no hope of ever achieving as high as the other guy has kind of gotten to, he can feel as though um, the 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 hardcore type player is victimizing him in some way, particularly if the game is very combative or it's very kind of me versus you or player versus player type of stuff. And and the the whole kind of result, if you like, is that you can end up with, and I've seen this a lot with um, with games, you can end up with a culture of players around the game who are only very specifically interested in. And are only very hardcore if you like about the game. I think we may have uh, briefly lost Tig there, um, and I'm definitely interested in you know hearing his opinion about you know sort of the hardcore versus uh, general audience. Um, we'll get him back just in a moment, I'm sure. But in the meantime, um, here Sorry. we go. There's Tig back with us. Welcome back. Okay, so Sorry. where we left off, Tig, where I no no don't worry, where where I left off with you was. Uh, you were talking about how the hardcore players can kind of negatively influence the yeah. uh, casual players because they feel like it's us versus them. Mm -hmm. So yeah, so it's it's the difference to kind of kind of the pro league and the sort of Sunday amateur kind of player. The the guy who's in it because it's essentially almost like a second career for him, and the guy who's who's in it purely because it, you know he just kind of wants to have some fun. What seems to work very well is um, as a sort of principle is to try and provide if you like portions of the game or parts of the game world or parts of the experience or competition layers or levels that are only targeted at that one sort of very pro group and kind of allow them to sort of do that off their in their own sort of side space if you like and keep the the more casual players a little bit safer so like in in massive multiplayer games you have um in massive multiplayer games you have um you often have kind of player versus player servers for instance where the players who are really into kind of team combat or death kill or whatever between each other can go do that. But you also have sort of safe areas or you have like areas where players can't harm each other or that kind of thing. And, and that, right, right, right. And 
quite a lot of the more casual players, the more social players, the more, um, as Rob Bartlett would say, kind of the more socializer type players. They like to just live there. They just like to hang out. And they like to kind of be a part of it without having to sort of feel like that they're competing against everybody. Right. And this is this is a particular complexity when you're designing experiences kind of in the real world where those people are going to sort of mingle with each other. And to some extent, the power of the system that you're building is actually about those different kind of classes, you know, yeah. rubbing up against each other in a way so that the new player actually can see, oh, the player with a lot of experience, XP, status, whatever, is getting a tremendous amount of benefit. Um, yeah, yeah. It's a little bit different from the virtual game world, isn't it? I mean, I suppose, but if you're, if you're if, to use the Air Miles example again, if you're an Air Miles collector every once in a while and you see a guy who's got that like 10 million card or something, I mean, you've seen the, the, the George movie, George Clooney movie up in the air is a really good example of it. The guy who's got the black card who gets through all the lines early, who gets, there's a sort of a weird, like, oh my God, what a, what a, Pardon my language. What a dick that guy is, kind of effect. <laughs> as well as the the oh, isn't that kind of cool that he can do that? You know, it's like well, I'm never going to get there, so screw that guy. Like that's like, it's 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 curiously demotivating sometimes. It's the other. So the other two you know, though, you'd ask. Demotivating, demotivating side of that kind of status. Um, and if you're just joining us, we're on the gamification revolution. Uh, I'm your host Gabe Zickerman. We're here with Ty Kelly a game designer, creative director at Jawfish, uh, author, writer at uh, TechCrunch. And uh, you can you can come see um, me and about 50 other uh, gamifiers at, at Gamification Summit uh, this spring, April 16th to the 18th in San Francisco. You can uh, register and find out more at gsummit.com and use the code GREV to save uh, $200 off your ticket. Um, if you are uh, watching us live right now, you can also ask a question by clicking the submit question button or camera button and we'll bring you on uh, the show, the buttons may be in different places depending on how you're watching. Uh, click one of those buttons and we'll bring you on the show and uh, you can ask your questions of Ty uh, and me at the same time or separately. So we already have one question from uh, our, one of our frequent viewers, Seamus. Thanks, Seamus. So uh, Seamus is uh, always interested in uh, uh, sort of the education question. He talks about uh, tournament-oriented games on tablets would be great for the classroom, which seems like a logical fit. Do you guys have any interest, or are you working on anything at Jawfish that might be more educationally oriented? I mean, I don't want to. I don't want to ever rule anything like that out. At the moment, we're working on on much simpler and more kind of straightforward stuff. Um, the kinds of games we're working on right now, and uh, one of them is a word game, for example. One of them is a mahjong game. We have a kind of a poker game coming through. The 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 technology that we have is very sophisticated, and in many ways, there's a really great experimentation period that we feel like we're going through where we're kind of trying to discover how players will use this and how they will kind of find the most um, fun out of it. There may very well be educational um, applications sort of to that in the medium to long term, but I, we're not quite there yet in terms of being able to, to sort of answer that question with any kind of um, clarity. Why, out of curiosity, why can't those games, uh, you know, just from your, I'm curious about your perspective, you know, don't you feel like people learn a lot of stuff incidentally from games? Like, do, do games oh, yeah. need to be explicitly educational to be educational? No. In fact, my preference is is um I is if they're not if they don't um try to sort of formally didactically try to impart information to people. My own per I can only speak for myself, I guess, but my own personal experience is that I learned an awful lot more about Japanese history by playing Shogun Total War kind of by accident than I sort of formally learned by ever reading about Japanese history. I really kind of understood the various components and parts, the various um, uh, sort of forces that were in play and stuff like that by playing the game without ever having to kind of sit down and go, right, okay, so what happened in and where and what were the dates and all that kind of stuff. The kind of education I think the games are really good at is that kind of almost um, depiction sort of thing, like where you're just produced into a space. You see this a lot with board games. You're introduced into a space you sort of acclimatize and learn the various levers of that space, and that in turn imparts a certain skill or talent to you. We tend to be quite bad at getting people to sort of understand facts or to kind of take in facts, like you would with a book or a movie or, or something like that. Um, but it's the it's the broadened thinking. It's the oh wait a minute kind of stuff. That's what games are really really good at. Right, and to me also it feels like the systemic thinking, which is. That, that's a different kind of thought process that actually is very hard to get in a book, right? In fact, yeah. whatever we've tried to teach systems thinking to people, we've always used games, but they've been, maybe they were more paper pencil, like let's yeah, play yeah. A, a mock parliament. We did a lot of mock parliament. Right. 
Right, exactly. And the thing that kind of really sort of fries me about that to an extent is the sort of the kind of anti-game or the negative game uh, kind of image that is quite prevalent a lot of the time, particularly in Western society, um, which is this whole kind of games are a waste of time sort of thing. Um, that, that just drives me insane. I mean, I, I really liked and I really think Jane McGonagall's got the right idea with trying to explain to people, for the want of better word, that games really help broaden your mind and really help you become a better person and feel better and all that sort of stuff. Um, because they do. Again, in my own experience, they absolutely do. They, they, they really have a very positive effect on, uh, on my life, on people that I know's lives. And the whole kind of negative addiction type stuff that people kind of worry about, it, it's very, very overblown. Yeah, I, I tend to agree with you. I think it's always interesting to, that that is something that we have to still be evangelizing. But um, sure. I, we have yeah. Roderick Campbell with us. Hi, Roderick. Can you hear us? Hi, Roderick. Yep. Hi, guys. How are you? Hi. Good. Great. Do you have a question for, uh, for us? I do. So the project that we're working on is called Commit Change. And what we're building is a platform where people can explore local stories and kind of inspiring causes in their community. And then in a myriad of ways, engage with those causes and support them. And then see detailed analytics about all of their actions mm -hmm. so they can see their social impact in the community and then over time build a legacy where they can see their achievements in that community and also all of the lives of the people who they've actually impacted okay. in, their, in their local hometown. Mm -hmm. um, so we're using gamification obviously to get people from point A to point B and then also to build that legacy over time. But one of our main concerns is uh, using strategies that cause donor burnout or cause user burnout over time. So do you see certain, are, are some forms of gamification, do they cause higher burnout rates than others? Well, what kind of gamification, what are you trying to do when you say you're using gamification? What, like, can you be more specific? Yeah, so we can create, for instance, um, if you're supporting a local cause, you can challenge a group of your friends to raise the most money for one of those causes. Mm -hmm. Or uh, we can also allow you to, if you share a story on Facebook, and this is pretty cool. So say you see an inspiring cause, you share that. We can show you all of the people who you've reached with that story. And then also any of those people that engaged because of that story or donated because of that story. And because of that, we can calculate kind of your amplified or indirect social impact also. Okay. okay. Um, so it opens up, I think, a range of possibilities and we're, we're not sure which to go with. Okay. So the thing is, I've worked with a few startups that have in sort of the educational and the sort of um, uh, behavioral in, and various kind of spaces that, that sort of try to do a lot of stuff like that. And their approach is often that kind of, you know, we give you the tools to enable to sort of get your friends involved kind of thing. And um, they almost all find it very, very difficult to actually get that to work. The, the kind of validation side, which Gabe had asked earlier, which I didn't really address, the validation side of successful gamification really relies on a pre-existing community that is already sort of disposed to thinking and to, to acting and to, to sort of engaging on that subject in that way. A really good example of that is like Reddit upvotes, where people sort of post about cool video games, for example, that they that they really are into and that they want everybody else to be into. And they're posting to a pre-selecting community of people who are also into the same thing. On the other hand, posting like your kind of climate politics, for the lack of a better word, onto your Facebook page is sort of like those people who around election time start posting Obama banners on your Facebook feed and you're kind of like, yeah, okay. Like, it, <laughs> it doesn't, um, just the fact that, that you're kind of, well, I will say you're, well, I have a lot of Democrat fans. Um, but the, the, um, the, the, the fact that you're kind of putting it in their face does not really actually sort of drive their, their kind of engagement. It's a little more unwanted, for want of better word. So, for me, I clarify. Just what to I, clarify, we're what not, I would try not a political platform, oh, it's, it's right. primarily a non-profit social, cause social, social, social impact. Yeah, so kind of inspiring personal stuff. Mm -hmm. um, I think we have, we have a little lag with Kai. I think we've lost, yeah, yeah. No, no, I'm, I'm just going to say to you, Roderick, actually, just to give you a piece of feedback. And for those of you who don't know, a Roderick's company, Commit Change, will get the URL in the chat right now, uh, doing awesome stuff, and of course was, uh, was the winner of our a weekly kind of gamification feedback challenge here on Gamification Revolution. And if you have a company, a startup that's interested in getting feedback from folks like uh, my guest, like Tyg, who's an awesome game designer and creative director at Jawfish or myself, uh, you can uh, enter your company's name at, at gamification.co slash live and uh, get upvoted and, and we'll bring you on the show. The one thing, Roderick, that you asked very specifically about is burnout. And I, I just want to, I want to move over there for one second. 
Um, it's important, it, from my perspective, it's important to remember that uh, two things. One, especially when it comes to social change, being overly earnest may not be to your advantage. And when, you know, people don't love being beaten over the head with like, the environment's being ruined, the, like, the animals are being extincted, like, don't you know, don't you know? And the truth is like, we, we generally think that the meat, the concept is that people need to be better educated about subjects and if they understood the problems of the world better that they would be more inclined to act. But I actually think that those ideas should be divorced from each other. And so if I were you, I would focus on ways of getting people into some kind of regular habit associated with this kind of interaction. So look at what's a behavior that you can elicit from one person to another that's consistent with the community, as Ty is saying, consistent with the energy, the voice, the uh, connection that people have with each other. Get them into some kind of be like some kind of behavioral loop, which maybe you would call a grind, or maybe you know something else that's incremental that they can do on a kind of regular basis. That's less about um, you know shouting at the at the you know rattling the windows, telling everyone how bad the world is, and more about some kind of positive interaction with each other. Mm. And the second There's, piece that I would say to you, tying it back to Ty's kind of view about validation and, and feedback and so on. I, I often describe that that thing as um, being, you know, feedback, friends, and fun being my kind of three big things. And I think feedback is very important. If you look at successful change-oriented projects like Foldit, one of the things that they, I think they did very well is they showed you how you were progressing against this big goal and also how your contributions were moving the whole world forward on progression towards the goal. So don't expect people to be able to make the conclusion between, you know, what are they doing in the moment to how that affects the whole world. And if this action in the real world is really small, you know, just mechanistically, you'll need to make that progress system look more uh, like it's got motion in it. So if I'm contributing a penny right. at a time, but we need to raise $100 million, you need to break that down into different kinds of progress so I can I feel like I'm making some kind of uh, progression along the way. Any final thoughts from you, Ty? These guys? Uh. Assuming that we get you back, okay. I think we, I think we may have uh, briefly lost you there. But um, so, what's the URL for Commit Change, Roderick? So folks can uh, find out more about what it is that you're doing. Yep, it's just commitchange.com, and it's still in development. But we release as soon as we develop, so it'll it'll be changing rapidly over the next month. Awesome, great. Well, yeah. thanks so much for your question. Thanks for coming on. Thanks for the feedback. Good luck with that. Awesome. Cool. Thanks for having me. Thanks, Roderick. Um, so I want to bring you back. Actually, uh, we have some more questions kind of waiting here. Uh, sure. Maybe education related questions Ty. but before that I just want to uh, pop you back. You also wrote this really, this article that I thought was really interesting about how um, real money games are kind of boring and I think you yeah. were you were talking about sort of gambling and the kind right. of memes and tropes in, in sort of gambling and I can't help but you know one of the, one of your central complaints was you know nobody really innovates poker nobody really innovates uh, these sorts of games so then I hear kind of the original designs that you're doing at Jawfish and mm. when you say the mahjong, uh, right, poker, right. and uh, yeah. right. So, are there any original ideas at all? Let's start there. <laughs> are there? Who was it that said there are no original ideas under the sun? Um, no, I mean yes, there are. There, of course, there are. The 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 complaint, if you like, with with the real money gaming space is not that. Um, Oh my God! The entire remodel gaming is such that that there can never be any innovation within it. It's not that. It's my complaint is more that the companies that are involved in real money gaming don't try. That what they tend to do a whole hell of a lot is pretty much we still. When I lived in the UK particularly, you would see this an awful time, awful lot of time. You see blanket advertising at certain times of the day for slots games or for poker games or for bingo, particularly bingo. Or, uh, or that kind of thing. And they are all identical products. They are exactly the same um, kind of game. In some cases, they literally are the same game engine repurposed again and again and again for um, for different sort of uses. And that's just quite low value. Eventually, what happens is, um, like the users sort of notice overall that they're kind of being invited to play the same sort of thing endlessly. Um, they're, they're sort of seeing the same loot teams um, over and over and over. And that's just not very, uh, interesting for them. So yeah, of course there's room to innovate with poker. Of course there's room to innovate with slots or mahjong or crosswords or Tetris or bejeweled or or kind of whatever. The question is whether you're willing to, whether you're actually willing to try and, and make something work from them or not. We feel we are. We feel because the it's the the kind of games that we're working on. For example, the poker game we're working on is not like every other poker game. I know that sounds trite, but and until you see it, you'll see you, you won't necessarily see what I mean. 
but it's not. It's really trying to use um, that kind of ability to throw a thousand players into a tournament at the same time and have them all play real time against one another at the same time. It's trying to take advantage of that. And um, and what I think what we've, we've come up with it will do that. I think people are going to be quite surprised at how weirdly addictive it is um, compared to how other poker games kind of feel. Like normal poker. So yeah, um, jumping around here a little bit, we've got a question from Roger Gopalan, and we've got Seamus actually waiting to ask a question on camera. Sure. Um, and, and Roger Gopalan, thanks for the question. He asks about designing for kids. Um, now, when we talk about designing any kind of game-like interaction, for kids, he's asking about five to ten, but let's just you know take like mm -hmm. twelve and under in general as a as a kind of broad brush. Sure. Is is it really that different to design a gamified experience for young people, or all are these principles mostly the same? And the window dressing is it's different. No, it, it it is. I think it is different. Children are much better, are much broader. No, they're much better at believing. So um, a really good example: the game um, Snakes and Ladders, or I think you Americans call it Shoots and Ladders, but it's the same thing is a game that no adult really finds fun because they can tell straight away that the whole thing but a child doesn't understand that a child's um, comprehension of what's going on in the game is considerably smaller on the one hand but also considerably more excited by the possibility of what they're sort of seeing um, on the other hand um, whereas like a, a grown-ups game like bridge that's just not something that children will ever find fun at all it seems difficult they can't really understand the rules of it very well there's no easy kind of mechanic, if you like, that they're using, like rolling dice in, in Snakes and Ladders, which is just kind of fun all by itself if you're seven years old, um, to, to, sort of, to sort of address them to. So yeah, more delightful, but much simpler games um, seem to be the, the kind of the thing with children, things that are physically much more delightful. Um, but at the same time, you don't necessarily have to be as, as deep. You don't actually have to create a complex strategy sort of, sort of set up in the background of the game to make it work when they actually find games like Snap to be more fun. Do you, um, what about things like uh, like progress or uh, or validation in your case uh, for children? Mm -hmm. Does does progress matter? Do they, are they sensitive to ideas like progress? And and what about yeah rewards? yeah? I mean, kids are the like whatever skills have used this kind of thing for schools rather have used this kind of thing for years. Gold stars, all that sort of stuff. They're very sensitive to the idea, particularly that they are achieving sort of. Um, they're achieving in kind of older kind of people's eyes that their parents kind of feel that they um, they're doing well that they're earning not just earning reward in a kind of an air miles kind of sense yeah, yeah I'm going to get stuff but in a kind of I've done well um, kind of thing again adults don't really I think um, find that nearly as interesting but kids do kids love that kind of thing so so there is some dividing line we probably need a little bit more research to uh, to figure yeah, out there exactly. Is exactly what the difference is. Thanks for that question, it's, Roger. It's, it's like have... that... I was going to say, sorry, it's like that there's some point where, like at the age of 12 or 13, where the brain kind of flips and just goes, wait a minute. <laughs> of course, you always have that breakup when you have something really, mm. I wonder if it's puberty related. Um, so, uh, Seamus, thanks for coming on. You're going to get today. I think you're going to get today's last question. Uh, if you can hear us, what's your uh, what's your question for your uh, for Tyg or me? Hi, Tyg. Um, I was just curious when I was looking at some of your games. Uh, what is the what's the influential base model of games that you're you know kind of growing your games and basing your games off of? You know, you think about um, okay. checkers, chess, tic tac toe. Uh, if you wanted to just so um, not to sort of self promote, um, but there's an article that I wrote a while. <laughs> it's an article that I wrote a while ago um, called the Four Lenses of Game Making, which talks an awful lot about sort of four different types of or approaches to games. I would, for example, I would um, classify a lot of kind of old school arcade games as what I call Tetris. They're based around one very simple but very extensible kind of game mechanic. A lot of sports are like that as well. I would classify a lot of um, gamification style games as behaviorist. They're, they're more kind of about sort of what comes out of the game, what the outcomes are, and how to guide players kind of toward those outcomes, which is also true of gambling and a number of other games. Didn't hear the last part. But... Well, I was getting a little bit of a breakup with the yeah. guy today. Oops. Um, 
Never a good sign. Okay, well, hopefully we can get him back. Thanks, Seamus, for being on. Hopefully we'll get him back. We'll get that answer uh, back for you before the end. Thanks for being with us. Thanks for watching. Uh, so often, Seamus, often a guest of ours here on Gamification Revolution. And uh, for those of you who um, who will get a chance to come join us at Gamification Summit, uh, please do. It's gsummit.com, April 16th through the 18th in San Francisco. You can use the code GREV to register for the conference and, and save $200 off of your registration. Um, and also, if you have a startup and you'd like to get feedback here on the Gamification Revolution uh, from uh, me and my guests week after week, you can submit your startup at gamification.co slash live and, um, and uh, put your startup into the list there. Hey, Ty, briefly before we run out, we lost you there in the, con in the context. Can you repeat your answer to Seamus' uh, question? Of course. Sure. So what I said was that at this article, the four lenses of game making, that you have four kind of types. You have tetrism, you have behaviorism, you have narrativism, and you have simulationism. So tetrism is like single mechanic games, like Tetris, like sports, like games where the rules are few, but the outcomes are many. Whereas um, behaviorist games tend to be more like the outcomes, you, you intend to achieve certain outcomes. So the rules may be quite fragile, but the objective is you want to get players to a certain point. Uh, story games, narrativist games are like that, but they're trying to impart a fiction. And simulationist games are things like World of Warcraft, where you're trying to create a whole world where they feel like that they can kind of walk around and inside. It's kind of from that basis that I tend to think of games a lot. That's sort of where I tend to start, trying to figure out, I feel like, which box am I trying to, to sort of design toward, and then um, work out, if you like, kind of what works within that. Cool. Well, and folks can follow you on Twitter at, at Tide Tiger. T-I-E-D-T-I-G-E-R, I think if I got that right. And uh, of course, they should watch out sure. for great uh, new things from Jawfish. Thanks for being with us today, Ty. Um, and uh, thanks all of you for joining us on the Gamification Revolution. I'm your host, Gabe Zickerman. Continue to follow along with me on Twitter. I'm at gzickerm. And again, we'll see you next week when we've got another great guest on here. And keep having fun, everybody.